So, okay, I'll give a little introduction then. Last time, uh, in, back in May, uh, I invited Paul to speak on the subject of films before Frankenstein, using the 1931 Frankenstein as kind of the start, even though it was not literally the start of the 1930s. It was such a watershed moment that I thought that it was a, a good, good point to make a break at. So we talked, uh, Paul started talking and answering questions and we used up the hour and a half plus a lot faster than we used up the movies. So among the movies that he talked about last time, and we can certainly bring back some other points if people want them, but some movies he talked about last time were The Golem, were uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, were Metropolis. Those were the three that stuck in my mind as the ones we spent the most time with. But I know there were a there were some that I was not sure if we had touched upon. There were some that I know that we had not touched upon. And then there were some when in some of our subsequent film discussions uh, got brought up, like Claire brought up uh, Jacques, which is not Jacques that everyone knows about, but the other Jacques, which no one knows about. So since you brought that up, I. Uh, Claire, I just thought you might want to just give a, a, a real quick mention of that and we sure. can either pursue more detail or not. Yeah, um, so Jacques is a 1919 movie. Uh, it's French, obviously. Um, and it is either just a war movie, just propaganda, or the first uh, cinematic de depiction of a zombie apocalypse uh, ever uh, because towards the end of the movie all the victims all the French victims of the war rise from their graves to ask the French civilians why didn't you help me more basically uh, why didn't you push harder for us to win um, and the way it was filmed they got like people who had actually been injured in world war one so these people were missing limbs missing parts of their faces still with bloody bandages they actually like went to veterans hospitals and got those people to play the uh resurrected soldiers um so it's sometimes cited as an early example of zombie you know symbolism as used in a what's not otherwise a sci-fi movie right so it's interesting in that way yeah, I would just add a couple of things because uh, I, I looked into uh, that movie. It's also, for the reasons that Claire just mentioned, considered to be a very profound pacifist movie because what it's basically saying to the French citizens in the world at large, you, you know, we sacrificed our lives for what? You know, how, how have things gotten better? And, uh, you know, that's actually something that's totally opposite of what most zombie apocalyptic movies can do, right? I mean, the zombies have like no morality. They're, they're not there to like shame us. <laughs> they're there to eat us or kill us. So actually in that sense, uh, if it is a zombie movie, which it is in part, you could say that zombie movies have gone downhill. Uh, the, the other point I'd make about that movie, which I found fascinating is in addition to using real veterans you know, to show the damage, the horror that war bestows on, on people who have to fight the wars physically, they, they also did a lot of scenes on real battlefields. And uh, that in a way was a precursor of a, a movie that was made, I think in 1945, and uh, it, it's Open City, I think is the name of it. And it basically takes place in Rome, literally uh, after the, uh, the Mussolini regime is toppled and the Nazis are driven from the city. And, and that movie is considered to be a great sort of mix of cinema verite because it's actually shot in the streets of Rome right after the war and, and a, a, a fictitious narrative. And so in a way you could say that Jacques Hughes initiated that trend. And you know, one of the things that I've learned, uh, you know, just looking into these movies, and I actually learned it 20, 30, or 40 years ago, whenever, but I had to some extent forgotten, is other than the new techniques, obviously there wasn't digital technology back then. So in that sense, there are new things in movie making. But as far as the themes are concerned, 
you see over and over again, themes that we sort of associate with a much more modern uh, you know, approach to life, for example, pacifism shown in a movie, but they were doing pretty much literally in the earliest days of motion pictures. And I think that says something about the relationship of motion pictures to the human psyche and to the creative human mind. One thing I found out about Jacuzzi is that it was written and directed by Abel Gans, who did Napoleon, right? And Napoleon, the restored version was shown at uh, Radio City Music Hall in 1982, right? 1981-82, you know, right? With a full orchestra, right? And uh, that was very, very fascinating to see. Because uh, he was his, uh, Abel Gantz was considered the Stanley Kubrick of his time, right? Who would uh, reshoot and re edit his films uh, over the course of years. Right? So there's various versions of Jacques out there. Yeah, well, that's not so the, the, these various versions, because what happens is, you know, the, the further back you go, uh, people get interested in it and they, you know, do slightly different cuts of the movie. And mm -hmm. so if you think about it, in those early days, movie was more like theater. Every theatrical production was a tiny bit different. People did make different versions of the same movie. The other point, by the way, I think we talked about this last time, but it's always a good point to make. The appellation of silent movie is actually a misnomer because what they were talking about is there was no talking in the movie and, and maybe not even any recorded music, but what they very often had was literally in the pit of the theater, as the movie was showing, they would sometimes have a full-fledged orchestra. And you know D.W. Griffith, who has been justly condemned as a racist because Birth of a Nation, his masterpiece, does glorify the Klan, uh, I mean, he's an interesting character because he, no one expected that, but th there's no taking away from his genius. And in Birth of, of a Nation, there was a fabulous orchestral score that goes with that, quote, silent, unquote, movie. Yeah, I actually was reading Harpo Marx's autobiography lately, and he talks about how one of his first piano playing jobs was to accompany the movies um, in a very, very cheap place, but he couldn't read music. He never learned to read music his whole life. So every single movie got the exact same accompaniment, <laughs> <laughs> which was just him playing songs he knew over and over. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, not being able to read music, uh, Paul McCartney doesn't read music and, and he's not only a great uh, bass, and for that matter, keyboard instrumentalist, but has written some. Neither did Charlie Chaplin. Chaplin never read music. He used um, uh, composers, David Raxon, a lot to um, work out all the notes on uh, manuscript paper for him and record the music, especially the, the thing, lights. The other thing that's interesting is that if you play a random soundtrack, to a silent film, your mind kind of syncs it up in some way. Uh, we discovered that there was a silent film that a batch of fans from the Philadelphia Science Fiction Society made back in the 50s, uh, which was a takeoff on Jack Williamson's Darker Than You Think. And they put, they, they played a phonographic record with it. And at a certain point, you know, it really almost seemed as if certain, as if various scenes were, be, that if, or if the music was recorded for those scenes, or if the scenes were scripted to match with that music. It's just something about the wiring of one's brain. Oh, and I thought of a couple of other movies that you mentioned last time. Uh, so just getting them out of the way, there was a trip to the moon and then there was the sequel. I don't recall if it was a trip to Venus or it had to do with a, a trip to Venus, even if that was not actually the title, but just refreshing people's memories. I think yeah, the so three Stooges took a trip to, the, uh, to Venus. <laughs> 
We also briefly mentioned last time, I believe, the, the lost world. Uh, my brontosaurus has escaped. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, the lost world, I, I don't know why, but I've always had a soft spot uh, for those movies, that kind of movie. As a matter of fact, uh, if this room looks a little different than the room that I was talking to you from last time, that's because last time that was my office in our home uh, in, in Westchester County, New York. We're now up uh, in our daughter's home in, uh, on Cape Cod. And uh, she just bought this home, so we, we don't even really have much furniture here. But the reason why I'm mentioning that is if you drive on Route 6A, uh, on Cape Cod, between, let's say from Brewster to Dennis, uh, you, you pass like a little patch of land and there's like, a, you can make a, a turn into it and it leads you into a place that I think of as the town that time forgot. Because you're driving and there's nothing like but grass and trees on the side and it's totally unkempt, it's wild. And something you, you, you pass, a church, the remains, what used to be a library. And it's like a little town isolated there in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and as soon as I saw that, it made me think of all these movies I've seen over the years, how people happen upon the, these lost villages, lost towns, lost worlds, however they may get there. And they always have a special uh, charm for me. As you probably know, The Lost World is based on a, uh, an Arthur Conan Doyle novel, 1912, and the movie was made pretty quickly after that, just, you know, like uh, 13 or so years. And one of the things that I always like thinking in these patterns, uh, and as I'm sure all of you have come across this, is the close relationship between mystery writing and science fiction writing. You know, on the one hand, they have very different protocols. You know, as I often say, if you have a mystery story and you find a dead body in a room and everything is locked from the inside and, and time shows that the you know, body has been there X amount of time and the person didn't commit suicide and that's what the mystery is, you can't solve that in the mystery genre by saying, well, someone beamed in and killed that person and then beamed out. Because what you're doing is you're bringing in the protocols of another genre, science fiction, into the mystery setup. So because of that, a lot of people uh, are under the mistaken impression that somehow these are two very separate genres. But if you look at what writers actually did, Isaac Asimov not only wrote science fiction, he, he wrote mystery, he wrote detective stories. And in fact, his robot stories are literally a hybrid of science fiction. Yeah, The Demolished Man, that's, that's uh, another good example. Um, and so it's not at all surprising that although Arthur Conan Doyle was known for Sherlock Holmes, that in fact, he wrote you know, some really very popular and influential science fiction uh, novels. Um, the other thing that I like about that movie when you look more carefully at it is that the guy who did the special effects for The Lost World, his name was Willis O'Brien, listen to this. He went on to do the special effects for none other than King Kong. So th this is another important point uh, that I always you know, discuss with my students. Very rarely does something just come out of thin air into the popular culture. If you, if you examine the roots of it, sure, there's a first time for everything. But if you're talking about you know, a movie that has so many exciting components like King Kong, clearly uh, there were precursors to that in a variety of ways. And plot wise, they actually have a certain parallel as well, especially at the end where the previously somewhat docile uh, animal freaks out when you get him into a city because he doesn't know what all these lights are, right? Um, it, complete with, you know, both real great apes and real brontosauruses do not eat people, but towards the end of each movie, they are both freaking out and eating people, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, that's a very good point. Uh, you know, it, it's just irresistible when you have something like a brontosaurus. It doesn't look necessarily fearsome, but it's so huge and it's, you know, it's so beyond the human ability to deal with one on one. That's mm -hmm. almost irresistible uh, to set them up as they, they're going to eat you up alive, even though they're vegetarians. Well, and if you went to the trouble of building all these miniature sets, they must be knocked down by your brontosaurus, or else really, why'd you do it? <laughs> Absolutely right. Yeah, dinosaurs are another thing. You know, and if you think about it, uh, th there you see a direct cause and effect between what was actually happening in the 1890s and thereafter, when they, and even a little before, when they, archaeologists, began really uncovering these fearsome, monstrous skeletons, and we began identifying them. And yeah, you know, they were dead for millions of years, but it was too much to resist to somehow think that maybe somewhere, somehow, they survived and this is what would happen. So that was a great movie. Um, one of the movies, by the way, I wanted to mention, um, which I think um, actually Phil mentioned to me, is a movie that's much, much better known than The Accused or The Lost World. Obviously, that's the 1923 version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And uh, that's interesting for all kinds of reasons. First of all, once again, it's written from a great novel, the Victor Hugo novel of uh, 1831. And it's interesting that, again, we talked about this last time, the Frankenstein story goes back even a little earlier than that. Uh, but uh, there was a science fictional fantastical theme, definitely at large in the first half of the 19th century for sure. But um, two things that, I, that struck me about that movie in terms of the connections and, and apropos of, of the lost world being uh, a sort of testing ground for Willis O'Brien for the techniques that he would bring into King Kong. One of the people who was involved, one of the producers, the main producer of The Hunchback of Notre Dame was a young man by the name of Irving Thalberg. And uh, he was considered actually the boy wonder of movie making back then. Because he was in his 20s when that movie was made. He went on, uh, Thalberg, uh, to even, you know, he had like, you know, something to do with a whole bunch of other movies. He unfortunately died at a very young age died of a heart attack in the 1930s. Many people think that if he had survived, he could have gone on to have been one of the greatest movie producers of all time. Uh, and, and so a, as it is, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, even though because it was a silent movie and, and later on, of course, they remade it as a uh, talking movie, but that uh, was really Thalberg's introduction to movie making. And that movie received a lot of acclaim in its time. The other point about that movie, and you all recognize this name, is that the star of the movie was none other than Lon Chaney, who went on to have such a great career. And, but I have to tell you, uh, you're all familiar with the song, the uh, Warren Zevon song, Werewolves of London. Dun, 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 dun. So now every time I hear Lon Chaney, I, I think of that line from Werewolves of London. I saw Lon Chaney walking. Dun, 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 dun. I saw Lon Chaney Jr. coming. And so, you know, Warren Zevon had a good appreciation because between the, the father, Lon Chaney, and then his son, Lon Chaney Jr., that father and son, Basically, they accounted for like probably 50 different horror movies. Uh, in the case of Lon Chaney Jr., they were all in the talking motion picture uh, realm. In the case of Lon Chaney himself, obviously, he did some silent uh, work in that movie. So it, that movie, I think, is something that uh, deserves a lot of uh, attention. And... Um, 
I, I, by the way, I should mention, you may know this, most of these movies are available in their entirety on YouTube. And they have the great advantage that their copyright has long since run out. Now, the current copyright, as you may know, is the life of the author plus X number of years. That's a long time. Um, back then, copyright was like 28 years and you could renew it. But a lot of these uh, movie companies back then didn't think it was worth renewing uh, the copyright on a silent movie because who would want to see a silent movie if you're not talking about the 1940s and 1950s? And of course, they totally missed the point that those movies were historically very valuable. And unfortunately for us, we can see those movies, uh, just about all the silent movies in their entirety, and sometimes more than one version uh, on YouTube. So, uh, you know, I strongly recommend uh, that movie. It's not just it's not just that it's it's some of the companies that made some of these movies, they were bought and sold and went out of business and then their assets were purchased and then resold, and it was very easy to have whoever was the person that theoretically was responsible for renewing their copyright copyright to have it lost in the shuffle among the corporate reorganizations and bankruptcies. Absolutely. Yeah, look, and, you know, the fabulous thing about movies, though, which, you know, we're all aware of is, sure, uh, the, the substance that the movie is stored on, some kind of celluloid, some kind of filmic substance, although it's certainly not invulnerable, and it can burn up, uh, in, you know, in a, in a fire, you know, it can get destroyed in a flood. But by and large, you know, they, they, very, they last a, uh, a, a very long time. And that's why we're very fortunate. Sometimes movies were thought uh, to have been lost forever. And um, much to everyone's um, delight, they, uh, they, sur they resurface later. Yeah. That happened with Metropolis, right? Like they found a copy just like 10 years ago uh, and it had been copied off of its original, you know, um, very highly flammable film. So it's like a poorer quality. I saw a version with those scenes cut back in and it looked okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call it great. <laughs> well, this is, you know, that is another fascinating story. When, when, a, when a movie... Uh, or even a, a brand, let's say like Walt Disney's movies, become incredibly famous, then we're extremely interested in every slightly alternate version. Um, but that doesn't happen if something is not quite that successful. We tend to have the assumption because we're so you know, suspicious about everything that somehow good parts were cut out of the movie. And, you know, if, if only the editor, you know, had, had been more careful, we would have had a more enjoyable experience. But I think Claire's experience with uh, the restore, one of the restored versions of Metropolis is a very common experience. I mentioned Disney because he is often uh, criticized for the editing that he did because he was uh, both personally someone who liked to do edits. And not only that, the, the credo of the Disney operation was make sure you have everything as tight as possible. You know, the enemy of a great animated motion picture is you have too much in there, the audience loses interest. Uh, but over the years, people have assumed, well, my God, you know, if I can only get my hands or my eyes on what Disney had done originally, what was in the movie originally, I'll be in for all kinds of wondrous revelations. But all too often, as Clara is saying, when you see the uncut version, if you get a chance to see it, you realize, hey, it does drag a little bit. And maybe that's why Walt Disney said, no, I want that cut out. Um, I was gonna mention apropos of animation, I made some notes, let me see if I can find uh, which 
what I want to talk about. Um, yeah, there's a movie called The Adventures of Prince Ahmad. Uh, and actually, uh, Phil told me about this movie. It's a 1926 German film. And I was, I was looking into that as well. It's the oldest surviving animated feature length film. And remember, I think last time in May, we were talking about how did animation begin? I said, by and large, there weren't uh, feature length movies until Disney. So this was a tiny bit before Disney. Disney was doing work in animation in the 1920s, but they were shorts, not uh, you know, full length feature films. But the reason why I'm mentioning this now is uh, I saw somewhere that actually there were, uh, because people wrote about it, at least two full length animated feature films made in Argentina. Interesting, even back then there's a connection between Argentina and Germany uh, in terms of animation. And they've been lost though. No, no one has been able to see them for like, you know, almost a hundred years. But this is exactly the point uh, we may, you know, have to change what's written in the books. If like right now, as we're talking, maybe someone somewhere in Argentina has just bought an old house in the country and, and they find like in the crawl space, some old celluloid and it's in pretty good condition. And they put it on a, uh, a real to real, uh, you know, film, uh, illustrator or film projector is the word I'm looking for. And, uh, and then that movie will come back uh, into the history books. So um, it's a fascinating thing, you know, to look at the various different edits and cuts and also movies that have been lost to us, but also movies that have come back to us and have uh, discovered, been discovered. Yeah, what's that uh, that Phil's holding up? Yeah. Well, Paul, since we you're since you're talking about Ahmed, and I suspect that the younger people, I mean, Pam and I remember this from when it was shown in the '60s on Wonderama or things like this. But I suspect our younger people may have never heard of this. So I plugged in what we were talking. I plugged in a three-minute section, and as you're the host, I just thought you might want to just show a, you know just show a three-minute clips because. It is a diff very different style of animation that is doing, and since and uh, you're you should have the share screen. Capacity. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'll do that. So. Very different kind of animation than you're thinking of. It's cutouts and not motion. Has anyone seen a uh, Martin Scorsese film, Hugo? No. Uh, in Hugo, uh, it's about a little boy who meets someone uh, who turns out to be played by Ben Kingsley. And Kingsley played um, George Melieu who uh, made the uh, silent film, A Trip to the Moon. Right? And in the movie, Hugo, he did animation similar to this with cutouts. Yes, Disney uh, decided not to do this because it was too expensive. I believe this is a three and a half minute thing. So it's not, we're, we're not subjecting you to a full movie. It's okay. But apparently it's ended. <laughs> okay. Sorry, but, do you want me to, to finish that? I thought you just wanted to watch a minute of it. Oh, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. It, I simply wanted people to get an idea as to what this animation style is. Cause if you're, if you're expecting Mickey Mouse or uh, uh, the classic cell animation versus hand cut stop motion. Exactly right. <laughs> it's animation was a completely different kind. <laughs> well, it was a completely different kind, but it was still the same principle. It was just a different way 
And if you think about it, it's really fascinating. The, the essence of photography and then motion photography is you're capturing the world as it is, not as an artist sees it. And you know, th that's what the camera was in the first place. And then motion photography picked that up and put the world into motion. But if you think about animation, in a sense, what that's doing is it's going back to painting because you, you are drawing something, you're, you're painting something, and then you're putting that to motion. And um, so in a way it's much more creative because you can put in whatever you like in, in the animated cell or in the cutout, just as the painter can paint anything she or he wants. But the, the conventional non-animated real action motion picture to some extent is limited by what do the actors actually look like. You know, you can change the lighting on the actor, you can hire a different actor, you can change the angle on the actor. Obviously you put different words into the actor's mouths, but in the end, what the audience is going to see, certainly a large part of that is what the actor actually in reality looks like. In animation, you don't, you're not at all limited by that uh, situation. So on the one hand, animation is freer and more conducive to even the wildly creative spirit than a conventional motion picture. But on the other hand, animation is more old fashioned because it's not taking advantage of the magic of the photographic camera. So if you think about what we just saw uh, with Prince uh, Ahmed, uh, there was nothing in that sequence that looked even remotely like what things look like in the real world. And um, so in the case of, of Walt Disney, when you get back to the very first Mickey Mouse movie and there was a short and then the later movies or whatever, no mouse ever was as lovable in reality as Mickey Mouse was on the screen. Because, you know, not, it's not just the words that Mickey Mouse said, and it's not just that little adorable squeaky voice, it's the way that Mickey Mouse was detailed in the, in the illustration of the character. Completely different than if you were shooting a real mouse or a real human being. So I, it's a fascinating branch of, of, of media history, I think. And by the way, Disney is fascinating also. Oh, hello, Julia, how you doing? Uh, Disney is fascinating also, uh, because if you think about it, by the time we get to the 1950s, although Disney is still making blockbuster movies, he becomes increasingly known for what? His television, the Mickey Mouse Club, Annette Funicello, the Mouseketeers, and what all of those have in common is they're dealing with real human beings. So Disney himself goes from animation to real human beings on the screen because he, he wanted to explore something different. Uh, but the, the other thing, by the way, about Prince Ahmad that's worth knowing is the, the story that's presented there was uh, something that was already part of the Arabian Nights lore. And there have been lots of movies over the years that have been focused on the Arabian Nights in one way or another, both animated movies and real action movies. And they have taken some of the themes that the Prince Ahmed uh, movie uh, used as well. I, but to tell you the honest truth, I don't know about you, I'd be interested in what your view is. This is the truth. The only animated movie that I ever paid money to see was Fantastic Voyage. You know, that Isaac Asimov movie with little minuscule, you know. That wasn't an animated movie. That was, was a live action movie. Oh, was it? Yeah. Oh, oh fantastic. The okay. TV series was animated. Oh, okay. TV's Fantastic Planet, the French movie, I believe. Yeah, believe Fantastic it. Planet. Okay, right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic Planet. But that shows you how 
uh, biased I am against animated movies. It's not that it's not because I think they're childish, you know. It's just that I'm more interested in seeing human beings uh, on the screen than I am an artist's depiction of what a human being might look like. And uh, you'll probably remember his name. Who is the guy like in the last 20, 30 years has made some really great animated movies? Um, Batsky. Yes. That's Fritz right. the Cat. That's right. So you know what? I haven't seen those either, even though uh, they've been acclaimed uh, for, for the same reason. He um, also did a version of Lord of the Rings, the first part. That's right. Yeah, good point. By the way, apropos of that, and completely aside from our topic, um, you probably know that there's going to be a new, you know, Lord of the Rings that's going to be, I think, on what Amazon or what uh, Netflix? I think it's Amazon, and um, I'm just wondering how that can possibly hold up to the, you know, the great trilogy that. Well. Uh, it's a different story. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, I, I know, but it's not done by the same filmmaker, right? So I'm not saying that nobody else can make a, you know, a great version of that, but boy, it's, you know, it, it, because it's a different filmmaker, it's going to have different sensibilities. And, you know, look, maybe I'll, I'll eat my words or eat my hat after that comes out. It's it's what it's going to be a it's going to be a, a television series, right? So, yeah. Anyway, um, let's uh, talk about something else that I came across. I wanted to talk to you about uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So first of all, once again, I mean, again, you see the amazing number of these early movies that are based on great earlier printed work. And of course, this is Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It was a novella. Uh, it came out in uh, late 1880s, I think 1886 maybe, and um, caused a storm, had, had a huge uh, following. And, uh, basically, uh, one of the things that helped propel Robert Louis Stevenson into famedom back then. Um, but I just want to mention that here we have an interesting thing historically. What we were supposed to be talking about tonight were films before Frankenstein part two. So uh, I looked this movie up and it's interesting. It, it, it's listed as a 1931 movie. So, okay. Um, Frankenstein was also a 1931 movie, as we know. And I did a little more research and discovered that Frankenstein was released here in the United States on November 21st, 1931. So then I tried to see, well, when was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which by the way, like Frankenstein, the 1931 movie was also a talkie. Because remember, as I mentioned last time, after the jazz singer, everyone quickly realized that's what the public wanted. Uh, I found a very interesting thing, although Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was made and finished in 1931, uh, it was not officially released, at least here in the United States, until January 3rd, 1932. So not that it really matters, but if we're talking about the criterion of films before Frankenstein, at least here in the United States, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde misses the cutoff point by about a month. Uh, as it comes out a little over a month later than Frankenstein here in the United States. But if you're talking about when it was actually made, here, you know, I'm sure a film historian could answer the question, uh, which movie was finished and ready to be released first? And, and, and both, no doubt, that happened sometime in 1931. But was Frankenstein finished before uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or vice versa? But this is why when you make these distinctions in the, um, you know, in movie history, 
uh, it's important to know exactly what your criteria are and what you are basing it on. So um, I honestly don't know the answer to the question, but I would say this, that uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was made in the United Kingdom uh, or whatever it was called back then in England or whatever. It didn't get to the United States until January 3rd, 1932. Chances are it was out in England a little earlier than Frankenstein was out here in the United States. In which well, case, in which Paul, case, yeah. not, to, uh, not to make you look bad, uh, but there was a previous version done in 1920, which definitely makes our cutoff. I just put the link, the Wikipedia link to it, but uh, oh, that was- Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, um, Wikipedia. Wikipedia says there's been 32 adaptations of the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, of which about 10 to 15 came out before Frankenstein. So you're still kosher. All right, All right, good. Yeah, well, I, guess, <laughs> I was attracted to that 1931 movie because again, it's, I, I saw a part of it on YouTube and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, movie, an excellent portrayal. And by the way, there are clips of it on YouTube, but thank you, uh, Phil, that's, uh, that's an important point. I, by the way, as far as the, uh, the adaptations, I read somewhere that if you combine the theatrical, that is stage adaptations and movie adaptations, that at some point, I'm not sure when this point was made, but whenever it was made that there were more adaptations made of that story than of any other printed uh, book or story in a magazine. So, um, so that does support all the points you're making there. Um, I, I, by the way, it's also worth mentioning about the 1931 version that uh, Frederick March won the Oscar for best actor in that movie. By the way, another reason that I sort of gravitated to that movie in my defense, my father always thought that as a young man, he looked like Frederick Marsh. And um, he, I think he did to some extent. Uh, so that's why I've always had a soft spot for Frederick uh, Marsh, uh, a great actor. And um, the other thing, you know, to, to keep in mind about the novella, uh, which I also really like, and it's a surprise to all the adaptations. It, it also became known in retrospect as one of the classic and most successful of the Penny Dreadfuls. Uh, that, that's what it's all for. For one red cent, you could buy this, uh, this novella. And um, obviously Penny Dreadful itself has become a sort of catchphrase for a genre. And I think it's a great uh, moniker, a penny dreadful. So, so that, that combination, the, the inexpensive, the penny, and the notion of something being dreadful. So like for one red cent, you could have a dreadful experience. <laughs> Paul, I don't know if you ever saw it, but there was, I believe it was a three season series titled Penny Dreadful, which had a lot of the characters from those uh, Penny Dreadfuls as, as, as actual characters. And if you've not seen it, I can recommend it. It's quite well done. I agree. It was on Showtime, right? Was it Showtime or, or, or Cinemax? It was not I, HBO. I saw it on DVD, so I don't know where it originally yeah. came from. It was either Showtime or Cinemax, and it is excellent. And if I was home, I will show you a bag. I have a penny dreadful bag because I was reviewing some of that, some of those shows. And again, it was either Showtime or Cinemax. And I, I think it was Showtime. I bet on Showtime. You know, check it out. Uh, they sent me a whole bunch of swag as their thanks for my reviews because I agree with you, Phil. Uh, I think the episodes were really good. By the way, if I'm not mistaken, either the third season or whatever the final season was, it came back just in the last year or two. It had been off for a couple of years and then it came back uh, for, for, a, uh, for a season. 
it wasn't exactly a, it, it was kind of a, a sequel series. It was not, it, it did not have the same characters in it. It's kind of like uh, same universe, but different characters. Right. That's interesting. But I thought it had at least one of the main actresses were the same. Uh, am I wrong about that? The, um, I didn't see it. I don't remember. I think maybe one of them did, but I think most of them were not the same characters. Yeah, it was, whoever it was, it was the actress who played the character. She had black hair. It was usually done up high. And all right, uh, we, we can. Ava Green. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's move on to uh, to another uh, movie that. Uh, I also find fascinating because we haven't talked at all. I don't think I talked at all last time in May, but I've actually studied him a lot. Did we talk all about Sergei Eisenstein and the work that he did in montage uh, in the Soviet Union? Did I talk about that last time? Yeah, you mentioned it. All right, good. Because th this other uh, movie was not a Sergei Eisenstein movie, but it shows you the vibrance of the Soviet Union b before Stalin got in there and basically, you know, stamped out, you know, uh, whatever creativity was left by the time he got thoroughly into power to the point where the only movies that were made for many years in the Soviet Union were just outright dreary propaganda movies. There used to be an old ridiculous saying that the typical plot of a Soviet movie was Boy meets tractor, boy falls in love with tractor, boy loses tractor. And you know that the, the movies were weren't literally like that, but they were as boring and dumb as as that uh, satiristic criticism suggests. But anyway, uh, back in 1924, Sergei Eisenstein was really in his prime and uh, he, he was recognized around the world and so was Soviet filmmaking as really being very sophisticated and in many ways well ahead of Hollywood and even uh, the moves that were being made in the Weimar Republic in Germany. And so there was a Soviet uh, film called Elita, also sometimes known as Elita of Mars. And uh, it, it was made in 1924, silent movie. And uh, it uh, was not released in the U.S. until 1929. It definitely is on YouTube. I was watching it. And um, one of the interesting things about this movie is obviously the lead character is a woman. And it, it shows you that, again, in the realm of science fiction, uh, it was not so uncommon for women to have lead roles. It was uncommon in terms of other themes, other narratives, uh, other kinds of stories. But here you have a movie where actually in the movie, it's clear that there are forces uh, behind uh, this, uh, this, this princess um, who, uh, who are trying to control her. Uh, so it's not as if she's someone who has complete absolute power over her realm. But it is interesting and noteworthy that all the way back in 1924 in the Soviet Union of all places, that they do have a, a movie, a science fiction movie made about uh, a story that takes place on Mars. And uh, I don't know, by the way, whether what attracted Soviet filmmakers to that theme was that Mars was already known as the Red Planet. And uh, that could be the case. Uh, but again, even though uh, the Soviet Union is the last place you would expect that a woman would be put into such a preeminent role, uh, Elita is put in that role in, in that movie. Um, the other thing that I also you know, find fascinating about that movie is you rarely hear about that movie. Uh, I had heard about it once years ago and I'd completely forgotten about it until Phil mentioned it um, 
But when you, you know you talk about the history of movie making, uh, again, if you're talking about the Soviet Union, because Sergei Eisenstein was such a, a powerful incandescent force, and he didn't make that movie, you, you just don't hear too much about that movie. So uh, it's it's interesting uh, to, to find that movie and and see that uh, that movie as well. And and I uh, I highly recommend it. By the way, the fact that it was finally shown in the United States in 1929 is also interesting. I mentioned earlier movies that were made in England come over to the United States, but um, the truth of the matter was back then, it was a lot easier for movies to go around the world uh, than we might think. We sort of think we're so enlightened now and if a movie is made any place in the world to get shown, here in the United States instantly. Uh, well, that's not quite true anyway, but back then they were not so unenlightened as well. As a matter of fact, getting back to Georges Méliès and uh, you know, Trip to the Moon and his other work, one of the things that happened in the case of Georges Méliès is people here in the United States took his French movie and started showing it here in the United States without giving him any money, uh, even though there was no contract signed. And that was one of the things that got the film industry to focus on, we have to have a little order here. And uh, it's interesting that after all these years, you find similar problems now in the US versus China. To this very day, there are problems and complaints with Western films being shown in China. And, it, you know, it's very, very tempting when you're on the other side of the world to basically you have the movie just show it. Um, let's move on to a, uh, another movie, um, The Terror. Now, that's an interesting movie also because uh, it, it, it's, it, first of all, it has something to do with King Kong. And again, it shows you these interlocking lattice works of, of people. Uh, the, uh, the, the guy who uh, wrote that play uh, in 1927, his name was Edgar Wallace. Uh, the Terror came out in 1928. And by the way, it was the first all talking horror movie. So it, it deserves you know, credit for that. But one of the fascinating things also about that movie is Edgar Wallace, who died at the age of 56, uh, that is what, not very old at all, he died while he was drafting literally the script for King Kong. So this is the second thing we've talked about tonight where there's like a precursor of King Kong. And uh, he, he died in 1932, drafting an initial script for King Kong. Of course, King Kong came out in 1933. And, um, you know, as we've said, that also indicates a, uh, you know, not only the things that we're focused on now, but as Claire pointed out, this idea of uh, some huge creature in a lost world being less than totally friendly to the human beings that it comes into contact with. So this was like a, a very, very prevalent theme back in the, uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s. By the way, to this very day, you know, you sometimes hear scientists talking that theoretically, you could find a prehistoric creature frozen in such a way that as it thought out, it would come to life. Now, already we have found many, many prehistoric creatures who get thought out and they're whole and they have flesh, but they can't come back to life. But you know, if you think about it, it seems to me to be a relatively small scientific jump. It, it would be a form of suspended animation. So 
back then when people were talking about somehow prehistoric creatures coming alive again in, in the modern age, it was not as fantastical a situation or development as we might think. Because if something is frozen in place, it's just a question of how it's frozen uh, that uh, you know, will determine whether or not the living organism can come back to life uh, if it's thawed out. So far, as far as we know, that hasn't happened with any prehistoric creatures. But what I'm saying is, hey, this is a good science fiction uh, theme because it is so close to reality. Paul, you were talking about the terror a little bit ago, which then uh, led a little discussion between Pam and I. I don't recall, did we discuss or talk at all the, the 1922 Nosferatu last month, uh, well, three months ago when you were last here? Yeah, I think we did. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I, because that's such an important uh, movie. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, so if you look at, you know, just where these movies are made, um, you see basically Germany and Central Europe are powerhouses. The Soviet Union, the United States, England, um, and I guess France. And those are the places where the, the movies you know, in this era are really being put together very rapidly and, and set loose out in the world. And it's interesting, the, you know, the motion picture process itself was developed we may have gone over this last time, but it's worth mentioning again. It was developed pretty much simultaneously in three places. Here in the United States by Edison, in uh, England by John Fries Green, in France uh, by a bunch of people, the Lumiere brothers, even Georges Méliès. We did talk about that last time. Um, but it's interesting that uh, both in terms of the invention of the motion picture process, but in the actual making of movies themselves, you see them happening in many places in the world at the same time. And one of the reasons, by the way, that I'm such a fan of streaming, I think one of the best things that Netflix has done, it's, it, it has opened up television series and to some extent movie making to that same truly global international process. So you look right now on Netflix and you, know, you can see whether it's science fiction or detective movies, obviously a lot of them are made in the United States and in England, but you see movies made in France and Belgium and Spain and Cuba in Argentina, uh, in, in the Far East, you know, Japan, China, Korea. So in effect, what Netflix has done is it's recreated what was already going on back in the silent uh, era where you had these movies just popping up in different places um, all over the world. Um, also uh, with Netflix, both movies and TV, you're seeing stuff in, from places you not expect that European places like Norway, Sweden, uh, our, our, meet, our movie next month, that we should be, besides the film discussion, we have a monthly watch a specific movie and discuss it. So next month we're discussing a German comedic horror film, Therapy for a Vampire, which is in German with English subtitles, and that's the movie to watch and discuss next month. It's based, there's, there's a vampire who's been married for 500 years, he's tired of his wife, and goes to marriage counseling for Sigmund Freud. Uh, so you get all kinds of stuff. Yeah, well, I discovered, uh, I'm not the only one, millions of people have discovered a genre called Nordic Noir, which I bet if you go back to the 1920s, you'll find a science fiction movie or two, you know, before Frankenstein made in that uh, genre as well. And uh, as the title- What was the, that? What was the genre again? Can you type it in? N-O-R-D-I-C, N-O-I-R. I'll, I'll write it in here for you. Hold oh, on. okay, Nordic now, okay. Hold on. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, and those movies are made in, literally in Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Iceland. And the, the usual Nordic noir is some kind of detective uh, show, but uh, there have been some really excellent showing science fiction, both movies and uh, series uh, that, that have come out of that uh, new genre. And the movies again are in uh, whatever the language is, uh, you know, with English subtitles. But of course, one of the things that's changed since the 1920s is people now in those countries speak English almost as much as they speak their own native languages. And so you very often uh, have a movie where it's like half Danish, half English. Um, I'll give you, by the way, one science fiction example of a, uh, and again, this has nothing to do with uh, film before Frankenstein, but as long as we're talking about Nordic noir, uh, a series called The Rain. Uh, it, it's a uh, post-apocalyptic series. Uh, I think it takes place, I, I don't know, in Denmark. I'm not completely sure, but it's, it's some place. Yeah, it is Denmark. Uh, the, the idea of the movie is the rain carries, and this is pre-COVID, the rain carries a virus which basically kills every human being within hours after they get rained on by this rain. And uh, so that's pretty noir, pretty grim. And, uh, and again, it takes place over three seasons and it has all the characteristics of the noir, the Nordic noir genre. Um, all right, let's uh, talk a little bit. Again, this one comes uh, from Phil. Uh, another uh, well, well, well-known story, the Faust story. And uh, this movie is made in Germany, again, the Weimar Republic. And actually, let me say a couple of words about the Weimar Republic uh, and the history of Germany. I mean, it's sort of sad also, because again, in the, in the 1920s, you have this very, very vibrant German filmmaking uh, community. And they, they made some great, you know, films. And we talked about some of them last time, and now here we are again talking about it. And unfortunately, that was totally co-opted in the 1930s by uh, the Nazis, where Lenny Riefenstahl uh, makes these, they are technically incredibly powerful movies, trying for the Will and the Olympiad, but they bear almost no resemblance at all to the imaginative and free-flowing movies that came out of the Weimar Republic in the 1920s. Um, so this movie um, of, of Faust was made in Germany in 1926, and um, I also saw a part of it. It's considered the uh, most elaborate and technologically sophisticated production until it was surpassed by Metropolis, which as we talked about last time, that really just broke open the process of filmmaking in, in so many different ways. But again, nothing comes out of thin air and at the time, this 1926 uh, German movie was recognized as being very, very sophisticated. By the way, something that's worth mentioning whenever you talk about movies without spoken dialogue, which is what we call silent movies, even though, as I said, silent is a misnomer, and talking motion pictures where there is a spoken dialogue, is... Um, to this very day, and I always mention this every time I talk about this in any context, there are some film historians who think that there were aspects of filmmaking that were lost when movies made that sudden turn from no verbal dialogue to spoken dialogue. And the, the the logic of that 
whether it's true or not, is, is interesting. And that's why I'm mentioning it. it what these historians argue is that precisely because you could not explain what is going on with people talking, even though you had words printed on the screen, but how many words can you have printed on the screen, which is what they did in the silent movie uh, era. But because you couldn't have people just talking as we are, the filmmaker had to come up with ways of conveying the story just cinematically, just through the juxtaposition of images. So here again, we get to Sergei Eisenstein's montage, we get to the German mise-en-scene, you know, the, the various techniques of portraying a story just totally through images. Certainly, even if you have words, you can't possibly get the tone of voice. So you have to, in the image, show what that tone of voice would show. And in an alternate history, you know, if any of you want to write a, a science fiction story about this, you could write a, a story in which uh, talking motion pictures were never invented. And, and we here in 20... 21 are enjoying and loving now more than a century of these very silent movies that we've been talking about. And although attempts have been made to do a, a modern silent movie, and there have been a few of them, clearly those are not the way movies would have evolved had there been no talking motion pictures. So in a way, we're talking about an opportunity which was not taken. Uh, even though it seems so obvious in retrospect, of course you want to hear the person's voice. Uh, but there were some people back in the 1920s and some historians afterwards who said, no, sometimes you might not want to. Um, media evolution does all kinds of things. There were many actors and actresses who couldn't make the leap from silent movies to talking motion pictures because although they look the part, they just didn't sound the part. And the same thing happened in reverse when television supplanted radio as a narrative medium. You've all heard of Gunsmoke. And so, you know, when we think of Gunsmoke, we think of James R. Ness. He looked the part of the rugged sheriff. He sounded the part. Well, before Gunsmoke got to CBS television, it was a very successful serial show on CBS radio. And the guy who played Sheriff Matt Dillon in the radio version was an actor. I don't know how many of you remember him. His name was William Cannon. And um, yeah. Uh, it's William Conrad. William Cannon Conrad. Was his, Thank uh, you. He right. played a character on a TV show called Cannon. Yes, you're right. Thank you. His name was William Conrad. And his Cannon character was this like overweight guy. Um, he didn't look anything like what you would expect a rugged frontier sheriff to look like. He had a great voice, so he was great as James R. Ness when you couldn't see him. But when the media environment evolved, in this case, not from silent to talking motion pictures, in this case, from blind radio to radio with pictures, which is what television was, William Conrad just couldn't continue in the park. But as James correctly says, he had the last laugh, uh, William Conrad, because he did go on to play Cannon, who was an overweight detective. This was, by the way, part of what I call the defective detective phase of television TV detectives. Every detective has some kind of problem. Longfellow or Longstreet, whatever his name was, blind. Barnaby Jones was old. Uh, Cannon was overweight. Ironside was in a wheelchair. So for like 10, 15 years, in order for a detective show to be successful on television, the detective had to have some kind of problem 
that always he managed to overcome. So from uh, William Conrad's uh, point of view, that was a great boon for him because he then had a second career. But to go back to silent movies and what we've been talking about, many of the great stars of these movies just didn't have any kind of career after this new mode of motion pictures came along. So Al Jolson and the Jazz Center basically changed the course of cinematic history and put a lot of people out of work, even though he gave new people a good start. By the way, in some cases like Mae West, she's, she was in silent movies, but she made the leap. She was good in uh, talkies as well. Was well, maybe, I mean, that whole, go ahead. That whole thing, that whole theme of being unable to make the transition. That's the plot of singing in the rain. That's right. You got the woman with a squeaky voice. That <laughs> that's exactly right. I was going to ask though, may, I, you might know this film. So is Mae West in any silent science fiction or horror movie? I don't think so, but. I never saw it. Uh, Sorry, can you repeat the title? I I didn't mention the I didn't mention the title because I can't I can't think of the title. Oh yeah, Myra Breckenridge. I don't I've never seen the movie, but I thought I read a a, a plot a, a, a plot synopsis or a little squiggle somewhere that. She was a transsexual, which at that time would have been science fiction. That there was there was this guy, and they did uh, uh, a sex change and became a a a, a, a va boom woman sex. I've never seen it, but uh, but that would have been science fiction by stretching things at the time. Absolutely, yeah. They couldn't have done those operations back then for sure. So that that's a good point. All right, so Mae West then, uh, it would be an example of someone who did have a role in a silent science fiction movie and then went on to have a great career in, um, in talking motion pictures as well. Filmmakers though, not the, the actual people who starred in them, but the people who made them, many of them made the transition beautifully. For example, Alfred Hitchcock started out making a couple of silent movies and then went on to have a fabulous career obviously as a uh, as a director of talking motion pictures um let's see if there are any other movies we or you would like me to talk about well we don't have that much time so what about you are there any movies that you would have liked to hear us discuss a favorite uh silent movie Hold on, I'm trying to find something. Yeah. Oh, okay, we did cover, okay, we did cover that. Da, 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 da. All right. You pretty much hit everything that I had come up with when I was exploring the topic. Well, there, there, are, there are probably hundreds of other movies. You know, it's just a question of, uh, of, how, of how you how far back you want to go. I'm just thinking, that, were there any, uh, well, I mean, th there were obviously vampire movies, right? Nosferatu was a vampire. Were there any Dracula movies per se where the actual Dracula story was done as a silent movie before the, the famous ones that began in the 1930s? I would guess there probably was. Uh, because again, that was a very successful and well-known novel. Well, the story by Nosferatu is that they they ripped off the novel and they got sued for it because Bram Stoker's widow still owned the copyright and she was not interested in allowing any movie to be made at all. So I believe that the talking Dracula, the one where they actually filmed the English and the Spanish version on the same sets, but with a different cast, I believe that was the first official Dracula adaptation. Um, Although I'm looking on Wikipedia right now, and it, there, there's a reference to a 1921 Hungarian Dracula movie called Dracula's Death, which is lost, but that there are a few images and rough plot 
synopsis that exists. Right, so they probably made that movie without getting the permission of Bram Stoker. Right, yeah. same way Nosferatu was made, right? They did, oh, well, let's just not call Mrs. Stoker. <laughs> Maybe she won't notice. Yeah. So you have to wonder why on earth, I mean, that to us seems like unbelievable. Why would Bram Stoker's widow not want a movie made of her husband's great work? Part of the reason, and you know, this is something again that historians love talking about, and I always find fascinating. Back in the early 1920s, it was considered to be a serious step down to go from any other genre into a movie. For example, people who had careers on the live stage would always use different names when they went into movies. And it wasn't until you know, the middle of the 1920s that people for the first time actors began thinking, hey, I'll, I'll be happy to, to see my name there that is on the screen. So probably Bram Stoker's wife thought it somehow would degrade her husband's great work to have it made into this cheap flick. Well, I think it may not have just, it might not simply have been the matter of prestige. I know that before the Dracula, before the Nosferatu movie, Dracula had been adapted at least once, and I believe twice, onto the English stage where it was a roaring smash. And there could have been the feeling that a movie would be undercutting the revenues from the theater because at that time, most of the money that would be funnel to the creator would probably be coming from a theatrical version where they could control easily and monitor the box office receipts. Whereas, as, as you've mentioned, Paul, uh, pirated movies without paying people were being done all over the place so that uh, a Nosferatu or Dracula adaptation shown outside of a few select uh, sites probably would have been lost revenue for, theoretically lost revenue for the Dracula estate. It might not have been as stupid as we may think from our vantage point. No, that's, that's a very good point. By the way, did I tell you last time about this article that I came upon years ago called Motion Pictures, a primary school for criminals? All right, let me tell you about that briefly. First of all, I love what I love about this, in part, why I love this story so much is the way I discovered this article. My wife and I were at an auction years ago, and like I paid, it was one of these auctions where somebody held up like a box of junk. The auctioneer, you know, we have this, that, some ugly looking paintings. What does anybody want to bid for? So I said one dollar just to get the thing going, and much to my surprise and even horror, nobody else bid on it. So I got this box for $1. It was filled with garbage, but at the bottom of the box was a 1901 copy of a Good Housekeeping magazine. Literally Good Housekeeping, a 1901 issue. And so I'm looking through it carefully and I see on whatever page, and I still have a copy of this at home, um, there's an article, Motion Pictures, a primary school for criminals. And it's written by a professor by the name of William McKeever. And he basically goes on to say, oh, apropos of Penny Dreadfuls, it's bad enough that the minds of our youth are being destroyed by the Penny Dreadfuls that they read all the time. Now you see them go into these dank, damp, dark theaters to watch this material on the screen and it's further undermining the morality of our kids. God knows what they're gonna grow up into. So th th this was like an academic back in 1901. And by the time you get to 1921, the world hadn't progressed that much in terms of its attitude uh, towards movies, even though by our retrospective lights, there were some great movies that were made back then. But, but probably that indeed was also what was going on with Bram Stoker's widow. 
I think she may also have been influenced. There was a pretty famous court case um, from the Wallace family. Lou Wallace is the author of Ben-Hur. There was a very successful theatrical adaptation of Ben-Hur. So a movie studio decided they would adapt the play into a movie. And again, we just won't call the Wallaces. Maybe they won't notice, right? Um, and of course, what was happening was people who didn't want to shell out for theater tickets were paying five cents to see it at the movies. And there was a big uh, lawsuit over lost profits. And that may have uh, that may have actually influenced other authors uh, to be like, mm, do I want to be associated with the movies? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, one of the problems with movies that movies have always suffered from is the very ability to edit in film, which of course you can't really do on a live stage, that made movies seem like slick and artificial in comparison to just the legitimate theater, the real theater. And so if you were an author or associated with an author, you preferred your work to be part of the real legitimate theater. And uh, that, you know, that was something which definitely was in the minds of a lot of people until television came along and then television became the new bad boy on the block. Motion pictures were fine. And now actually streaming has done that to television. Now television with the advent of cable and even more so streaming network television now is no longer the cheap uh, rendition of a narrative. It, it may not be as good as a motion picture or a novel or a theatrical production, but it's a hell of a lot better than something that's just streaming somewhere. Uh, and for whatever, even though the streaming can actually result in the production and the presentation of great work. So the, the, there's something about the public that we always seem to want to have something that is not the most current, not the most recent in higher regard than to what is currently on the cutting edge, even though that cutting edge could well result in better and stronger material. Okay, well, we're going to be wrapping up shortly. Uh, one thing I did want to mention to everyone is that at next month's Films From Beyond, uh, we're having another one of our short film get-togethers. You're all invited to, uh, to make it. And what we will be doing is that we will share screening through Zoom and we'll be watching some short films and then talking about them. So we'll show a 10-minute film that's on YouTube and then say, well, what did everyone think about it? Then go on to the next one. We've had some, some pretty cool stuff shown uh, by some of the people here, Claire and by Julia, I know that last time we did this, we showed one of the movies that you had talked about in the last session, Paul, we showed the Edison Frankenstein, and uh, which was, uh, you know, actually quite good. And uh, so that is, and then that's where we first came up with, where Claire informed us of Jacques Hughes, where, uh, which led off this discussion. So we've kind of come full circle tonight. Again, I thank you. Uh, in three months, we will be starting a two, uh, a two part session of films from the thirties. Paul, if you wanna come back for that and join in with us, you can, don't make any commitments right now, but uh, you know, with, with or without you, we'll be talking about the, the, the films of the thirties and eventually we'll be hitting the films of the 40s, the 50s, and so on in 10 minute, uh, in 10 year uh, goals. So I thank everyone for making it tonight. I especially thank Paul for spending, giving us some of his busy time. Uh, this will be on Paul's website. 